Numbers, chapter 22, and I'll be reading verses 1 through 6. Then the children of Israel moved and camped in the plains of Moab on the side of the Jordan across from Jericho. And now Balak, the son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. And Moab was exceedingly afraid of the people because they were many. And Moab was sick with dread because of the children of Israel. So Moab said to the elders of Midian, now this company will lick up everything around us as an ox licks up the grass of the field. And Balak, the son of Zippor, was king of the Moabites at that time. Then he sent messengers to Balaam, the son of Beor at Pithor, which is near the river in the land of the sons of his people, to call him saying, look, a people has come from Egypt. See, they cover the face of the earth and are settling next to me. Therefore, please come at once, curse this people for me, for they are too mighty for me. Perhaps I shall be able to defeat them and drive them out of the land, for I know that he whom you bless is blessed, and he who you curse is cursed. Now let's pray. Father God, we're thankful to be here in the house of the Lord, to be instructed from your word. The Apostle Paul declared that every single word of Scripture is God-breathed and every single Scripture is useful to correct us, to teach us, to instruct us, to equip us for the ministries that you've called us to. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would come in this room today into every single heart and that you would do just that through this word And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, you may be seated. Last week I was teaching on a portion of the life of David. We talked about David going from joy to anger to back to joy again. And we are studying in the context of the Ark of the Covenant being brought back into Israel. The two Sundays before that, Pastor Steve was teaching out of the book of Job. And so you may be wondering, boy, this church teaches out of the Old Testament a lot. We're not afraid of the Old Testament. We love the Old Testament. And in fact, what do you think happened in the early years of the New Testament church before the New Testament was written? They studied the Old Testament and the apostles taught them the things of Christ hidden in the Old Testament and how they applied in the New Covenant. And so here we are in this story today. Now, the nation of Israel was camped in the plains of Moab after having destroyed the nations of the Amorites. So we should have a map that we can put up there. Yes, there we go. So you can kind of see there's a map at the lower right. There's an inset of Israel. They're on the east side of the Dead Sea, so they haven't quite crossed into the nation of Israel, which they will shortly You can see Moab at the bottom bottom sort of southeast side. That's the nation that sees Israel and is fearful. In fact, God had told them to not harass Moab, but to leave them alone. Moab was a descendant of the Israelites. He's descended from Lot as well as Ammon at the northeast corner at the top. They were commanded to leave them alone. But the nation of the Amorites, they were to destroy. And so they have, and they're camped out there on the plains of the Dead Sea, right across from Jericho, right before they entered to take conquest of the land of Canaan. And then you can see at the very top of the map, way, way, way uh, to the north, is the place where Balaam lives. And he's he's being um, summoned by (coughs) the king of Moab to curse the people because he's sick with dread. Now, of course, the nation of Israel derives from Abraham. Genesis chapter 15 Verses 12 through 16, we can read about that. You recall the story, it says, Now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and behold, horror and darkness fell upon him. Then he said to Abram, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and will serve them, and they will afflict them four hundred years. And also the nation whom they serve I will judge. And afterward, they shall come out with great possession. Of course, he's telling Abraham, this is 400 years before the time they're in Moab. Abraham hadn't even had a child yet. He's talking about his son Isaac and then the descendants that would follow, how they would end up going into Egypt. Remember the story with Joseph 
and how then ultimately they would become slaves of the Egyptians, but that God would not forget them. He would lead them out and bring them back into the land, which is what we're sort of learning about in the story of Balaam. Verse 15, now as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age. But in the fourth generation, they shall return here for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. So this Amorite nation that I just told you about, it's actually recorded in Numbers chapter 21, how uh, the nation of Israel was commanded to destroy them. So that was the king of Sihon and the uh, the king of Og. And yet we see the heart of God here. The iniquity of the Amorites is not yet completed. God is full of mercy. He is slow to anger, slow to wrath. 400 years, he lets his people be slaves in Egypt while the Amorites continue in their sin and ultimately finally ending in judgment. And you may say, well, how are they supposed to repent? Well, of course, the Old Testament scriptures largely document the history of the prophecies of the Israelite prophets. But here we find this peculiar story about this prophet named Balaam who has, hears from the Lord, and perhaps there were more prophets at the time who were prophesying to the Amorite nation, which refused to obey and heed them, which is why they were ultimately judged. And so now there's Balak, king of Moab, not even realizing that God told the Israelites to go around him and not bother him, seeking to hire Balaam to curse this people. So let's pick back up in our story, Numbers chapter 22, verse 7. So the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the diviner's fee in their hand, And they came to Balaam and spoke to him the words of Balak. And he said to them, Lodge here tonight, and I will bring back word to you as the Lord speaks to me. So the princes of Moab stayed with Balaam. And then God came to Balaam and said, Who are these men with you? So Balaam said to God, Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, has sent to me, saying, Look, a people has come out of Egypt, and they cover the face of the earth. Come now, curse them for me. Perhaps I shall be able to overpower them and drive them out. Verse 12, And God said to Balaam, You shall not not go with them, and you shall not curse the people, for they are blessed. And so Balaam rose in the morning and said to the princes of Balak, Go back to your land, for the land has refused to give me permission, for God has refused to give me permission to go with you. And the princes of Moab rose and went to Balak and said, Balaam refused to come with us. And then Balak again sent princes, more numerous and more honorable than they. And they came to Balaam and said to him, Thus says Balak, the son of Zippor, Please let let nothing hinder you from coming to me, for I will certainly honor you greatly, and I will do whatever you say to me. Therefore, please come and curse this people for me. And then Balaam answered and said to the servants of Balak, Though Balak were to give me his whole house full of silver and gold, I could not go beyond the word of the Lord my God to do less or more. Now therefore, please, you also stay here tonight that I may know what the Lord will say to me. And God said to Balaam at night and said to him, If the men come to you, rise and go with them, but only the word which I speak to you that you shall do. So Balaam rose in the morning, saddled his donkey, and went with the princes of Moab. And so here we read how the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian, which was another nation sort of to the southeast of Moab, uh, go to Balaam with money in hand. First, God tells them, don't go with them. Then Balak comes and sends an envoy of even greater nobles and, pro- and promises, saying, I will honor you greatly. But Balaam affirms that no matter how much money you give me, I cannot go beyond the word of the Lord my God to do less or more. And finally, after Balaam inquires of the Lord again, God gives permission for him to go, but with the condition, but only the word I speak to you, that you shall do. So picking up in the story again, Numbers 22, verse 22. Then God's anger was aroused because he went. 
And the angel of the Lord took his stand in the way as an adversary against him. And he was riding on his donkey, and his two servants were with him. Now the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand, and the donkey turned aside out of the way and went into the field. So Balaam struck the donkey to turn her back onto the road. The angel of the Lord stood in another place, in a narrow path between the vineyards, with a wall on that, this side and a wall on that side. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she pushed herself against the wall and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall. And Balaam was angry with his donkey, and he struck the donkey with his staff. Verse 28. Then the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey and said to Balaam, What have I done to you that you have struck me these three times? And Balaam said to the donkey, Because you have abused me, I wish there was a sword in my hand, for I would now kill you. So the donkey said to Balaam, Am I not your donkey on which you have ridden ever since I became yours to this day? Was I ever disposed to do this to you? And he said, No. And the Lord opened Balaam's eyes, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand, and he bowed his head and fell flat on his face. And the angel of the Lord said to him, Why have you struck your donkey these three times? Behold, I've come out to stand against you because your way is perverse before me. The donkey saw me and turned aside from me these three times. If she had not turned aside from me, surely I would have killed you by now and let her live. And Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned, for I did not know that you stood in the way against me. Now, therefore, if it displeases you, I will turn back. Then the angel of the Lord said to Balaam, Go with the men, but only the word I speak to you, that you shall speak. So Balaam went with the princes of Balak. So this rather unusual part of the story, first God tells Balaam he can go, and then we see that the anger of the Lord is aroused against Balaam because he went. And then we encounter these three separate occasions where the angel uh, of the Lord is standing in the way of Balaam with a sword drawn, ready to kill him. And in each situation, the donkey kind of sees the angel and moves out of the way to protect his master, but his master doesn't see the angel, and so he's striking the donkey. And finally, God just supernaturally allows the donkey to talk to him. And then at this point, we find out uh, why. Because the angel tells him that his heart is perverse. Now, in this particular part of the story, it's still hidden. What is the perversity in Balaam's heart? We don't actually know as of yet, and so we'll keep that concealed as the story unfolds. But the angel decides to warn him and send him, you can still go, but emphasizing, go with the men, but only the word I speak to you, that you shall speak. So picking up again in verse 35, or rather verse 36. And when Balak heard that Balaam was coming, he went out to meet him at the city of Moab, which is on the border of Arnon, the boundary of the territory. And then Balak said to Balaam, did I not earnestly uh, send you, calling for you? Why did you not come to me? Am I not able to honor you? And Balaam said to Balak, look, I've come to you now, now have I any power at all to say anything? The word that God puts in my mouth, that I must speak. So here, at this point, we've learned that there's some perversity in Balaam's heart, but I'd like to first start out and point out where Balaam is doing well. And, and it comes down to his response. At this point, Balaam realizes there is really no point trying to speak falsehood in the name of the Lord. He's just going to declare what's true. And, and as we'll see as we go through Balaam's prophecies, that's what he does. And unfortunately, many false prophets do differently. Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 16 and 17, describes some of these false prophets. It says, this is the word the Lord Almighty says. Do not listen to what the prophets are prophesying to you. They fill you with false hopes. 
They speak visions from their own minds, not from, my, not from the mouth of the Lord. They keep saying to those who despise me, the Lord says you will have peace. And to all who follow the stubbornness of their hearts, they say no harm will come to you. Here's the words, the false prophets. I think today in our modern world, uh, where we are today in many churches in the nation seeking to bless same-sex unions, how could we go beyond what the word of the Lord says? When the word of the Lord so clearly declares in the Old Testament and the New alike that homosexual acts are sin. In similar manner, many churches, heterosexual couples live together openly in sin and nobody says anything. Well, you say, how do you know that? Well, for the past 15 years, I've been working with kids locked up in prisons whose grandmothers dragged them to church when they were kids. And they start reading the Bible with me and learning like, wait, you're supposed to wait till you're married? We never heard of that. People in our church did that. Nobody said anything. In fact, sometimes they declare that the people in the church are more sexually promiscuous than the kids in the gangs. Oh, how hypocrisy stings when it comes out of the mouth of our children. Well, hear what the Apostle Paul instructed Timothy of the same type of false teachers that would come in the last days, the very days we live in. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3 through 4. It says, For the time will come where they will not endure sound doctrine. That's biblical teaching. But wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires. And they will turn away their ears from the truth and turn aside to myths. People want to hear what they want to hear. They don't want to hear sometimes the truth of God's word. As we shall see, Balaam would only declare a word from the Lord which was true. And I have great respect that that was Balaam's heart. And so now we're going to turn to his prophecies there. Starting in uh, Numbers chapter 23... We'll look at verse 7 to begin. So, he took up this oracle and said, Balak, the king of Moab, has brought me from Aram, from the mountains of the east. Come curse Jacob for me and come denounce Israel. How shall I curse whom God has not cursed? How shall I denounce whom the Lord has not denounced. For from the top of the rocks I see him, and from the hills I behold him. There are people dwelling alone, not reckoning itself among the nations. Who can count the dust of Jacob or number one-fourth of Israel? Let me die the death of the righteous and let my end be like his. And so here we see in this prophecy even reminds us how he says you can't count the dust of Jacob. Genesis 13, 16, God's promise to Abraham. And I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth so that if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants could also be numbered. And so how does Balak, the king of Moab, respond? Verse 11, then Balak said to Balaam, what have you done to me? I took you to curse my enemies, and look, you have blessed them bountifully. So he answered and said, Must I not take heed to speak what the Lord has put in my mouth? So we move on to Balaam's second prophecy. You can skip down to verse 18, chapter 23. And then he took up his oracle and said, Rise up, Balak, and hear. Listen to me, son of Zippor. God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said, and will he not do? Or has he spoken, and will he not make it good? Behold, I have received a command to bless. He has blessed, and I cannot reverse it. He has not observed iniquity in Jacob, nor has he seen wickedness in Israel. The Lord his God is with him, and the shout of a king is among them. God brings them out of Egypt. He has strength like a wild ox, for as there is no sorcery against Jacob, nor any divination against Israel. 
It now must be said of Jacob and of Israel, oh, what God has done. Look, a people rises like a lioness and lifts itself up like a lion. It shall not lie down until it devours the prey and drinks the blood of the slain. Behold, I have received a command to bless. He has blessed, and I cannot reverse it. I sometimes wonder if the Apostle Paul was meditating on these verses when he wrote Romans chapter 8. Let's look, Romans chapter 8, verse 31. If God is for us, who can be against us? Romans chapter 8, verse 32 and 33. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? Romans chapter 8, verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Romans chapter 8, verses 38 through 39. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. So how does Balak respond to this one? Verse 25. Then Balak said to Balaam, neither curse them at all nor bless them at all. So Balaam answered and said to Balak, did I not tell you saying that all that the Lord speaks that I must do? So let's move down to Balaam's third prophecy, chapter 24, verse 3. Then he took up his oracle and said, the utterance of Balaam, the son of Beor, the utterance of the man whose eyes are opened, the utterance of him who hears the words of God, who sees the vision of the Almighty, who falls down with eyes wide open. How lovely are your tents, O Jacob, your dwellings, O Israel, like valleys that stretch out, like gardens by the riverside, like aloes planted by the Lord, like cedars beside the waters. He shall pour water from his buckets and his seed shall be in many waters. His king shall be higher than Agag and his kingdom shall be exalted. God brings him out of Egypt. He has strengthened him like a wild ox. He shall consume the nations, his enemies. He shall break their bones and pierce them with his arrows. His, he bows down, he lies down as a lion, and as a lion who shall arouse him? Blessed is he who blesses you, and cursed is he who curses you. That very blessing was the promise God gave to Abraham, Genesis chapter 12, in verses 1 through 3, when God called Abraham out of the land of Ur some 400 years early, he said, get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house, to a land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And all the families of the earth will be blessed. So how does old King Balak respond? Verse 10. Then Balak's anger was aroused against Balaam, and he struck his hand together. And Balak said to Balaam, I called you to curse my enemies, and look, you have bountifully blessed them these three times. Now, therefore, flee to your place. I said I would greatly honor you, but in fact, the Lord has kept you back from honor. So Balaam said to Balak, did I not also speak to your messengers whom you sent to me? Balak were to give me this house full of silver and gold, I could not go beyond the word of the Lord to do good or bad on my own will. What the Lord says, that I must speak. And now indeed, I'm going to my people. Come, I will advise you what this people will do to your people in the latter days. Now, <clears throat> Balaam goes on to continue his prophecy, even declaring the coming of the Messiah some 1,400 years later, and even beginning to speak into what would happen in the end times. Other parts of the Old Testament speaks of the end times in the nation of Israel. 
I don't know how many of you saw the rocket fire going over Israel last night, how the nations are gathered. The book of Ezekiel actually talks about these things, how they should be signs to us that the end is near because it's already prophesied the very things that are beginning to happen. The end is near. But we don't have time to go further into these prophecies today. But I would like you to notice a little parallelism in the story. The parallel is the relationship between Balaam and between Balak and Balaam, between uh, the uh, Balaam and his donkey. Right? There's three times certain things happen. Balaam seems to be blind to what's going on, as does Balak seem to be blind to what's going on. And here, each time, it seems that Balaam's trying to help Balak understand, just like the donkey was trying to protect Balaam. Yet each time, Balak gets upset, just as Balaam struck his donkey the three times. He just couldn't understand. And, of course, this sign of the talking donkey had actually nothing to do with the king of Moab. It was supposed to be a sign and a warning to Balaam. Wow, look at this situation. It's exactly the same Remember the angel who had the sword drawn in his hand, and yet somehow Balaam just refuses to kind of see this. And so this perversity that's in his heart remains hidden, and so now we must continue on in the story in the plains of Moab as we pick up where we are with the nation of Israel. Numbers chapter 25, verse 1. Now Israel remained in the Acacia Grove, And the people began to commit harlotry with the women of Moab. They invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel was joined to Baal of Peor, and the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel. And the Lord said to Moses, Take all the leaders of the people and hang the offenders before the Lord out in the sun, that the fierce anger of the Lord may turn away from Israel. So Moses said to the judges of Israel, every one of you, kill his men who were joined to Baal of Peor. And indeed, one of the children of Israel came and presented to his brethren a Midianite woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel who were weeping at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Now when Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw it, he rose from among the congregation, took a javelin in his hand, and he went after the man of Israel into his tent and thrust both of them through, the man of the Israel and the woman through her body. So the plague was stopped among the children of Israel. And those who died in the plague were 24,000. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, has turned back my wrath from the children of Israel because he was zealous with my zeal among them so that I did not consume the children of Israel in my zeal. Therefore say, behold, I give to him my covenant of peace, and it shall be to him and his descendants after him a covenant of everlasting priesthood because he was zealous for his God and made atonement for the children of Israel. So tragically, while Balak, the king of Moab, and the elders of Midian couldn't get Balaam to curse the children of Israel, they did succeed in seducing Israel to sin against their God, and in so doing, bringing upon them the wrath of God. This generation, you might remember the history of Israel at this point, this generation had seen this before. They were children at the time when they were camped out at Mount Sinai outside of Egypt. These children walked through on dry land through the Red Sea as the Lord rescued them. These children saw the armies of the Egyptians behind them drowned in the sea. These children were there when God spoke from Mount Sinai, the top of the mountain of flames, speaking to them of the covenant. And they were there when their parents committed, we will obey the terms of the covenant. We will worship no other gods. But then, of course, while Moses was at the top of Mount Sinai, they had to witness their parents. After having made that covenant with God, they had to witness their parents convince Aaron, the high priest, to make an idol of a golden calf 
and they had to watch their parents worship it while Moses was on the mountain receiving the Ten Commandments. And what did Moses do when he came down from the mountain? First, he smashed the Ten Commandments, right? They've already broken them. He destroyed their idol. He ground it to powder. Exodus chapter 32, verse 25 through 28, gives us some more detail. It says, Now when Moses saw that the people were unrestrained, for Aaron had not restrained them, to their shame amongst their enemies. I want you to keep that in mind. Phineas' son is Eliezer, who's the high priest at the time of where we're reading, and Eliezer's son is Phineas. Phineas saw this. He saw his grandfather do this. Then Moses stood at the entrance of the camp and said, whoever's on the Lord's side, come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together, and he said to them, thus says the Lord God of Israel, let every man put his sword on his side, go in and out from the entrance to entrance throughout the camp, and let every man kill his brother, every man his companion, and every man his neighbor. So the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and about 3,000 men of the people fell that day. Fast forward 40 years, and now we see Moses in like fashion with the current generation, receiving instruction from God to take the leaders of the people and go out and hang the offenders, those who committed idolatry and harlotry with the women of Moab, and to hang them in the sun, the symbol of being cursed in the sight of God, that the fierce anger of the Lord might turn away. And then, what do we see next? These same leaders weeping at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Very place where the presence of God resided, where their joy was supposed to be satisfied. And here the leaders are weeping. And why are they weeping? The sin of the people. The sin of how they hurt their God. It pained them to hang their neighbors, their friends, and even on their brothers on those trees outside the camp. It hurt them. They were weeping at the tabernacle. And in the midst of all this, in runs this young man so obsessed with the beauty of this young Midianite woman he manages to attract at Baal of Peor. And he walks right before their eyes as if to brag about it and takes her into his tent. You know, we're all sinners in this room. We are all tempted. We've all failed. But how horribly tragic it is when we're unwilling to be restrained by our leaders, even the tears of our leaders as they plead with us. Can't they see their concern? They're weeping at the tabernacle. Can't they see that they're forcing them to make a decision whether to honor the holiness of Almighty God versus honoring their choice to sin? And here we see Phineas rise up go into the intent where it's implied that they're in embrace, possibly even in the act of fornication. He thrusts his javelin through them. It goes through both of their bodies, averting the wrath of God upon them. And what does God tell us about Phineas? He says, Phineas is zealous with my zeal. What does that mean? Well, Jesus tells us what it means to be zealous with the zeal of God when we're dealing with our own struggle against sexual temptation. Matthew chapter 5, verse 29 through 30. Sounds like something right in line with Phineas. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members should perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than your whole body be cast into hell. Brothers and sisters, do you have the zeal of Phineas and the zeal of Jesus when it comes to restraining your own carnal lusts? Which of you would be willing, if you're falling into this area of sin, to confess your sin to a brother and sister, endure the shame and the pain of saying those things, 
if it would restrain you. I think of couples who are dating, not yet married. From time to time, they might, in, in the midst of dating, there could be a situation where they find themselves falling into sin when they spend time alone. Would you be willing to say, we can no longer spend time alone until we're married, if that's what it would take to restrain you? Which of you, with a pornography problem, would be willing to install some kind of software to block it on your phone or your computer? And if that didn't work, would you be willing to turn the internet off to your house, trade in your smartphone for a flip phone? Might even need to switch jobs. It doesn't require internet connections at home. Wow, that sounds very zealous. Where are those who are zealous with the zeal of God in our, gener in our generation? I'm not talking about empty promises. I made a lot of empty promises in my life. God, I'll never do that again. Now well, that's just foolishness. I know my wickedness, and it needs to be restrained. I'm not talking about a prayer, God, I just need you to take away these sinful desires. God knows I have sinful desires. That's why Jesus went to the cross. He calls me to repent. What I'm talking about here are the practical acts that you and I can do to restrain our out-of-control flesh. Sadly, in many Christian circles today, people who acted like Phineas and who taught like Jesus would be called fanatics or even legalists. In Jesus' very same teaching, he spoke against the legalists of his day. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 20. He says, For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, those are the legalists of the day, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus doesn't call for less purity than a legalist. He calls for more. While Phineas <coughs> may not have been honored by the congregation, perhaps not honored among his peers, yet he was a man who was held in high honor in the eyes of God. And you know, when God honors a man like this in Scripture, I think we should honor him as well. And so we're going to read these verses again, and I'm going to invite you to stand as I read them in his honor. Chapter 25, verses 10. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, has turned back my wrath from the children of Israel because he was zealous with my zeal among them so that I did not consume the children of Israel in my zeal. Therefore say, behold, I give to him my covenant of peace, and it shall be to him and his descendants after him a covenant of an everlasting priesthood because he was zealous for his God and made atonement for the children of Israel. You can sit back down. In Balaam's first prophecy, back to Balaam, in Balaam's first prophecy in Numbers chapter 23, verse 10, he declared, let me die the death of the righteous and let my end be like his. Do you have a slide? Numbers chapter 23, 10. But by the end of his third prophecy, the sin of his own heart was exposed by the tempting words spoken to him by the king of Moab, King Balak. Numbers chapter 24, verse 11 where he says, the Lord has kept you back from honor. That word revealed what was hidden thus far in the story, the perversity of Balaam's heart. The Lord has kept you back from honor. It seems Balaam didn't return to his home with empty hands, but his honor with God retained. No, Balaam got paid, and he got paid through his counsel rather than through his prophetic cursing. Numbers chapter, 20, verses, uh, sorry, Numbers chapter 31, verse 16, we read, it says, it's on screen, Moses said to them, look, these women caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam 
to trespass against the Lord in the incident of Peor. You see, Balaam knew that he could not curse the Israelites by sorcery or by divination, but he knew that if he were to seduce them into idolatry and sexual sin, God's wrath would break out against them, effectively themselves becoming their own curse. And for his counsel, he departed to his home country with the honor that only Balak could restore him, which was the honor of money rather than the honor of God. The Apostle Peter in the New Testament, when he was speaking of false teachers, he likened them to Balaam, 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 14 and 16. He says, they have eyes full of adultery. They cannot cease from sin, enticing unstable souls. They have a heart trained in covetous practices and are accursed children. They have forsaken the right way and gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. But he was rebuked for his iniquity. A dumb donkey speaking with a man's voice restrained the madness of the prophet. But unfortunately, Balaam would not restrain himself. Jude, in similar force, speaks of false teachers in the New Testament again. Jude chapter 1, verses 4, 8, and 11, he says, speaks of them saying, they turn the grace of God into lewdness. Another word for lewdness is obscenity. It usually speaks of sexual vulgar things. They turn the grace of God into lewdness who claim authority from their dreams. Just whatever they feel, whatever they think, whatever dream pops into their head. They live immoral lives. They defy authority and scoff at supernatural beings or even things like the supernatural deliverance of God's word, which is unchanging. Woe to them. For they have gone in the way of Cain, who murdered his brother. They have run greedily in the area of Balaam for profit, and they perished in the rebellion of Korah. You may recall Korah was one of the Levites who rebelled against the priesthood of Aaron and Eliezer and Phinehas, saying, why, why, do they, why do they get to be the priests of God? This rebellion of authority given by God. And lastly, Jesus himself spoke himself spoke of the false teachers of the church of Pergamos saying in the book of Revelation, chapter two and verse 14, but I have a few things against you because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. Balaam's fate on earth was the same as was shared with all the other pagan kings. Numbers chapter 31 and verse 8 says, Balaam, the son of Beor, they also killed with the sword. Balaam's eternal fate was with the other false teachers, which Jude says they were long ago marked out for the condemnation in which he was referring to hell. And you may recall even Jesus' own words in the day of judgment when he said, many will come to me declaring, didn't we prophesy in your name? And he will declare to those like Balaam, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness, the hallmark of a person who refuses to restrain or exercise restraint of his flesh. Now, I don't know about you, but I want the end of my life to be like Phineas and not like Balaam. And the danger in hearing a sermon like this is that you sit in your seat and you say, well, you know, I'm a good person. Of course I'm like Phineas. I would never be like Balaam. Well, that would be a terrible mistake because there's a Balaam in every single one of you just as there's a Balaam in me. And how do you know that? I know it because I reach these moments in life where I'm tempted, where the honor of man stands before me, and I know, do I want that more than the honor of God if this comes into any conflict? That's how I know where Balaam is alive and well, and I have to recognize it and repent and rebuke it. Now, for some of you, you're just like Balaam. Money is the thing that you want more than anything. 
The idea of taking a lower paying job, if that's what it needs to restrain yourself to overcome sin or just to even have the time to spend with God or God's people, well, that's just out of the question. You are running greedily in the error of Balaam, seeking the honor only of a financial profit. For others, the honor you seek is more to be seen as spiritual. You want people to think you're a good person. Look at the words of Jesus, Matthew chapter 23, verse 27 through 28. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all cleanness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you're full of hypocrisy and all lawlessness. You know the difference between a hypocrite and a true child of God? They bring out those dead men's bones early. They're asking their brothers and sisters to pray for them. They're, they're pressing into the Lord. They don't want to just look like a whitewashed tomb and be full of all of that sin that was always there before them. But of course, the hypocrite, they just want to be seen as good. And so they always seem to know enough scripture to be able to twist it into some perverse doctrine that allows them to obscure and protect their own sin. Maybe it's the honor of being a cool mom or a cool dad. You just give your kids permission. Oh, you don't have to come to church. It's not that important. Refuse to restrain them in their sin. Refuse to discipline them. Your kids may call you cool on Instagram or TikTok, but God is not impressed. There are a million different ways in which this can play out in our lives. But ultimately, the voice of the enemy will get into your head, and just like Balaam, he will declare to you, the Lord has kept you back from honor. That is your dividing line. What is that thing for you? What is it that you feel that following hard after the Lord is keeping you back from honor? What is it that's more important to you to be honored in the eyes of man than the eyes of God? Every man and every woman needs to know what that is in him. That is your area of vulnerability. I know my areas. I probably don't know all of them, but I know several of them. What practical steps are you now willing to take to restrain yourself from falling into that trap? How you respond to these questions will determine whether your end will be like a Balaam or like a Phineas. Now, I also want to remind you, the worship team can come up. In the story, before Phineas thrust the javelin through, you recall that they hung the offenders on trees in the plain side of the sun to turn away the fierce anger of the wrath of God. Well, as New Testament believers... We have this truth, Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. It says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for it. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on the tree. We don't hang people on trees around here. Jesus was hung on a tree, so you don't have to be. We don't thrust people through with javelins here like Phineas did. Isaiah 53, 5, it's because Jesus was pierced for our rebellion. He was crushed for our sins. He was beaten so that we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. God's wrath is turned away from us because of what Jesus did on the cross. John 3, 16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen? Amen. Phineas didn't even know about this stuff. Phineas didn't see the cross. He didn't fully understand it the way we know it. So brothers and sisters, if we have such a greater revelation of the love of God than Phineas did, how much more should our zeal be for him? We have the prayer couples come up. You know, if you want to give your life to the Lord, 
Today is the day. Have the wrath of God set aside. That's why Jesus hung on the tree for you. So you no longer have to be under the curse. You can come to him. Jesus has given his life for you. And he will help you. He, he calls us to repent and he calls us to zealously repent. But he'll never forsake you or abandon you. As long as you're repenting, you are absolutely in the promise of God. He will never leave you or forsake you. And maybe today you're here in a place where something got exposed in your own heart. Some area of perversity, just like in Balaam's heart. Some area where you refuse to take restraint or action. Well, now is the time to come up and confess. James chapter 5, verse 16 says, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. So I want you to do this in this time with the couples as they come up. I'll be up here. And if there's something, some deeper area of sin or something or anything that you want to talk about, I will be after at service. I will be staying around. You can come talk to me. You can talk to any of the elders. And with that, I'll close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this word. Holy Spirit, now do your work. You know every person in this room. God, some people are encouraged here, Lord, because they've been restraining and they see your pleasure in them, just like your pleasure upon Phineas. Some people haven't been restraining and they need the courage to overcome their desire to be honored in the sight of this congregation and come humble their self that they might have the honor of God just to confess and commit to restraint, to finding the ways of God before them. I just pray your blessing over us in this time. In Jesus' name, amen.